Today we're talking TIG amp control, and in particular, foot controllers. In one of my earlier videos, I did essentially a, a show and tell short clip of this foot controller. It was maybe 10 seconds long and I didn't say a word. Uh, at the time I had built this, I was upgrading from this economy DIY pedal. Since then, I've gotten a heck of a lot of questions, comments, emails, asking for more details on this foot controller. And I thought, what the hey? Good enough reason to sort of break out all of my TIG control history and, uh, and chat through it. Hopefully uh, this will answer some of those questions and for anybody who's just getting into foot control or maybe trying to build their own, I highly recommend it. It's a whole new dimension to TIG welding. To be honest, I couldn't imagine how I could get along without one of these these days. So let's talk about what an amperage controller does. And we'll break into these and take a look at how they work. This is the torch that came with the machine. Um, at least I think it is. It's been a while. You see this one hasn't gotten too much use. They're very uncomfortable and rigid. But this is, I think, is a Binzel. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Sometimes I've seen them called Euro style torches and this one only has, you know, sort of a start stop switch. No amperage control whatsoever. I have a few torches, but the one that gets the most use is the CK Worldwide with the uh, flex cable. I'm not sure what number this is, but this is also a number 17. Oh, there it is. CK150 R8, R9. See, the torch has no controls on it just because I've slowly moved over to exclusively working with a, a foot controller. But I do have um, a push button for it. And this I can just sort of throw on with some electrical tape or some zip ties. You know, if you're in a situation where you can't use a foot controller, if you're working on something big and you need to walk around it, or you're climbing under a car or up a ladder, I try to avoid all of the above. And it's been a while since this has actually been on the torch. But it's good to have in case you need it. And it's just a simple push button. It could be anything. This is out of an old torch, but like I say, it's it's just a simple switch. It could be a doorbell off the front of your house for all the TIG machine really cares. So this is the first controller I ever started with. And it's actually a volume control pedal for a keyboard. I just picked it up at a music center. I think it cost me all of 15 or 18 dollars. Uh, it certainly has its limitations. It's all plastic, it's very light. Uh, the range wasn't perfect, but it was a good way to, to get started. We'll break this down and take a look at what the insides look like. After this I moved up to a homemade version. Like I said, I didn't like the feel of this and it was trimming off the top end and the low end of my amperage range. And that got frustrating enough that I sort of built my own. And this is what was shown in the earlier video. If you haven't seen that again, maybe take a look. This is halfway gutted. I disassembled it and we'll be rebuilding it, quote unquote, for, for the rest of the video. Just explaining how the parts work. I did make uh, somewhat of a dumb move and I used a switch just out of my junk box. This is the switch that initiates the high frequency start. This thing gave up the ghost on me. I don't know, a few months into using this foot controller and I wasn't able to find a replacement switch. At least not something that was easily uh, swappable. As I was looking for this, um, a friend of mine came across this foot controller. I'm not even sure what brand this is. Oh, there it is. SSC. Anyway, it, it ended up having the exact resistor value potentiometer in here that I needed for my machine. It didn't have the right connector, but it was easy enough to sort of uh, cut that off, reverse engineer what this thing was doing, and adapt it to my machine. The price was right, and I've been working with this foot controller. Though, to be honest, I was a lot happier with how the homemade unit worked. I mean, first of all, it's a lot heavier. You know, it stays where you leave it. It's a lot tighter. Uh, well, I mean, when it had the spring in it, it was a lot tighter. In terms of control, there was a bit more resistance. This one's a little bit, I don't know, 
loose. It works fine. I think I do lose a little bit of the low end on this. I get all the way up to the high end. But you know, you can sort of pulse it quickly and cheat your way out of that. Before we dig into the actual foot controllers, uh, I thought it might be useful to just talk about what the machine is actually expecting. I think these are pretty much all the same. I mean, unless you have state-of-the-art new, maybe all digital or wireless foot controller. I mean, check your manual, but your machine more or less will work this same way. Uh, the only thing that might change, or that's almost certain to change, is this resistor value, uh, the potentiometer value. In my particular case, it, my machine's looking for a 10K ohm range. So here's basically, this, this is the heart of what's in the foot controller. Everything else outside the circle is more or less specific to my machine and my connector. Now, there are a couple of details you want to keep an eye out for your machine. Here, for example, there's a, a small jumper. Without this jumper, the, foot con the machine doesn't know there was a foot controller attached, and all it would do is start and stop the arc. And up here in the detail, you can see a small note. Uh, if there is no uh, potentiometer, if there is no foot controller, it only needs those two wires, F and G, from the, uh, from the push button switch. Now, I apologize if this kind of stuff is going, you know, is stating the obvious or going too far back to the basics, but based on some of the feedback I got, it's, it became obvious that I have a, quite a varied audience in terms of um, experience level. So what's, what's happening in the foot controller is we have a switch and a potentiometer. And this is also true for, you know, torch-mounted amperage controls, the little slider buttons. They're just different types of potentiometers. Obviously, when the switch is open, the machine isn't doing a thing. As soon as the switch closes, the machine is looking at this resistor value and outputting some amperage to your torch. So in my case, when the switch closes, as you're depressing the pedal, the machine starts to read, you know, the resistor value. But when the fit, switch first closes, I think it's given me, I start off at the top end at the 10K ohm, and that's giving me the minimum, which is 5 or 6 amps on my machine. As I continue to push the pedal, that resistance value is dropping to 0K, or just 0, I suppose. And that's giving me my max. 150, 160 amps in my case. So note number one, make sure you um, connect your resistor correctly, otherwise when you first push the pedal, you're going to get 100 and you're going to get your max, and then as you depress it, it's going to start to slowly drop, so the operation of your pedal would be backwards. And that, quite frankly, is the stuff of nightmares. Another important point, and the most difficult part, I think, of making a foot controller, is the timing between these two pieces. So all you have in your foot controller, if you make a classic foot controller, is a rotation. So as you push the pedal, you only really have one motion that's controlling two separate parts. So as you push it and the switch closes, you've also been moving your potentiometer. So when that switch closes, you might be at, I don't know, 9K in this case instead of 10K. And so you've just chopped off 10% of your amperage range. So that was a long-winded way of saying we need some way to control the timing of that switch in relation to that potentiometer and make sure just, you know, the darn foot pedal feels good and is consistent. Let's have a look at how this uh, foot, the volume control foot pedal is doing its thing. The top plate of the pedal, and I added this aluminum tread plate on here, is just hinged through the side. It's got a plastic peg that comes through a hole, and this is the spring that you know, returns the pedal to the up position. As that comes through the hole, there's a spring that goes to a micro switch. And I think the spring is there just because I couldn't get the exact range perfect. I don't remember if that was original. I don't think that little solder mark looks very factory. So as I push the pedal down, you can, you can hear the switch um, activate almost immediately. I continue to push that down. It's changing the potentiometer value, and as I let off, 
switches off. Now, I don't know if you can see how screwed up that potentiometer shaft is in there. But this took quite a fair amount of tweaking to get the position of this on the shaft in the, in the right orientation so that when that switched on, that switch was in the right resistance range or, you know, at one end of its range. So I hope that's pretty straightforward. This little circuit board is part of the volume control. I think I, I, I didn't even use those wires. I just left it in there. I did at one point have another potentiometer that came in through the top that allowed me to fine tune the range of this potentiometer. Just because I, I think, as I recall, I was having some trouble getting the timing and the whole range out correctly. So here's where we run into what essentially was my first problem, uh, was the range of motion. See this volume controller really only has, I don't know, 15 to 20 degrees of motion. So that means my entire amperage range, 0 to 150 amps, is controlled within this 15 or 20 degrees. That's not a heck of a lot of, uh, let's call it resolution, for an amperage control. So, you know, you might move it an eighth of an inch and increase your welding by 50 amps. So the first thing to do is to add a little bit more range to that pedal. And here I think I'm in the, at about 40 degree range. That's spitball it and call it almost double. The problem with that now is I can't use the same type of pedal return mechanism, that compression spring that's in the inside, without having to make this pedal very thick. So your foot would be, I don't know, six to eight inches off the ground and just probably wouldn't be very comfortable. Also, the hinge is moved back. Again, it's more of a comfort thing. So as you actuate this, your heel doesn't come up as much as it does in this volume controller. See here the heel comes up almost as far as your toe goes down. So what I decided to do, instead of go with a compression spring, I decided to use a you know, spring in, in tension, an extension spring. And this is the spring I ended up settling on. This is more or less trial and error. You know, it depends how heavy your pedal is, how much resistance you like. The easiest place to put this, instead of the front, where the compression spring went, would be the back. So when you push the pedal down, it would pull it back up. But as you can see, there's not really space back there for a spring this size. So I had to lay it down on the inside. It's connected to that pin. That pin just goes through the foot pedal. And on this side, there's a small cable and wire cable tie. And the other end of this cable is tied inside of the foot pedal, exactly where you would expect an, an extension spring to attach if it were to fit. And what I'm going to do is just sketch out what this part of the foot pedal looked like. So here's my foot pedal in the side view, and that's the hinge. that the pedal's rotating about. And that's just a like a quarter inch countersink bolt and there's some nuts welded to the inside. So we said the Yamaha, or I think it was Yamaha uh, volume controller, just had a coil spring up in here and it was pushing the pedal back up. I decided to go with the uh, extension spring but it's too big to fit in the back to pull down on this side. So I put a pin in the foot controller, one that we just saw, happens to be this one. It goes, you know, from one side to the other. Put the spin, put the spring on that, to which I tied the cable that I just showed you. And that goes around a pulley, which is this one, in the base of the foot pedal, wraps around that pulley and is tied to the underside of the moving part of the foot controller. Now here I had that small wire clamp and the wires looped around there with a small set screw and what I could do is pull this and increase the tension in that spring. 
and that set the feel of the foot controller. So laying the spring down allowed me to get it into a smaller package and get that spring force down behind that pivot point so now that big spring is pulling down here and pulling that pedal back up. So I took the hinge bolts out of here. If I take the foot part, top part off the controller, we look inside. This is the uh, pulley. I just sort of installed it here. The spring is connected just to a fixed shaft. It happens to be a shaft that contains another free spinning pulley, but we'll get to that in a second. And the cable just comes over that hook around that pulley and up into the bottom of the pedal. The cable just goes through a hole and has a like a little cable lug. So that's the first part. That's the pedal return and the uh, force you feel under your foot. The next part then is the potentiometer. Now this gets a little bit tricky. In my particular case there wasn't that much space to work in. It's not difficult, it's just a little bit finicky. Uh, instead of building this into the bottom of the foot controller, I decided to put it on its own little frame. And it looks like it's just a piece of one and a half inch square tubing with some windows and some holes drilled in it. The idea here is that we have a small pulley with some very strong string wrapped around it. I could get this on the pulley. It lets you adjust the uh, potentiometer position by pulling on both sides. Now the string is tied to the pulley. There's just a, a little through hole there. Maybe you can see that better. It's just a single loop through a hole in the pulley so that the relative position of the string can't slip. So let's call that the pulley we just saw that the string is looped on. Got a, a turn or so of string. It's tied to the pulley here. On this end I have a smaller spring tied to the frame of the foot pedal. And in my case it's this spring here. It's just enough to uh, get the potentiometer to turn. This side, so this is fixed to the foot pedal, and I'll show that to you in the uh, in the actual pedal. It goes around another just idler pulley, and it gets tied to the bottom side of the actual foot pedal. So what happens when you push the pedal down? You essentially put slack in the string, and this spring can retract turning the potentiometer. When you let the pedal go, the pedal had that much larger spring that we saw just earlier. When you let the pedal go, it pulls this back up, overpowers this small spring, and turns the potentiometer back that way. Now there's probably a dozen ways you could do this, and I faintly recall looking into things like rack and pinions or linkages, but this seemed like the most compact package since all of these parts could essentially be in the same plane. But anyway, let's get back to this pulley. There's one important dimension here that is key to getting your pedal to work correctly. So this whole potentiometer subassembly, and again it's just the potentiometer with its nut on the inside, the shaft comes through, and there's a little Teflon bushing here. This fit in here. There were screws in from the other side that kept that in place. One end of this had the spring tied to it and was attached here on the underside of the frame. There's just a little loop welded there and this is where the uh, spring attached. I've got it temporarily tied here. That would be bolted down. So the spring is in the back. As I pull the string, 
It turns the potentiometer and stretches the spring. I'm missing a loop of string on that pulley, but I think you get the idea. The other side of the string goes over this pulley. That's just a fixed shaft, and this is just an idler piece of plastic. It wraps over that and exits the top of the base. So here it is coming in, out through the top. And I can pull this. That adjusts the potentiometer, and when I let it go, the spring that we saw pulls it back. And this bit gets tied to the underside of the pedal. Once you have the uh, foot controller together, you'll be able to measure what the effective throw is. So from full up, full down, this particular pedal has about, uh, it's called three inches. So in that three inches of linear motion, I've got to turn this potentiometer through its whole range. So I just took that three inches and, you know, sort of worked backwards to figure out what diameter this little pulley needed to be. The circumference of this is some multiple of three inches. It's, looking at it, it's probably half. So as I push this down, the sh you know, the knot on this will walk around there two times, ish. Once you have that dimension worked out and this is installed, you know, you let everything go, the large spring will pop the pedal up. I pulled the string through the inside here, made sure my potentiometer, you know, was at one end of its throw and tied that knot. So that means my potentiometer was starting, you know, at one end of its range. And as I push this down, the small spring would take it all the way through the rest of its range to the other side. So that takes us to the last piece of the puzzle, which is the switch that starts and stops the whole uh, amp control cycle. Now the switch might look a little odd because the entire top part has broken off. The only thing to be aware of when you're putting a switch in is how much throw you have at that switch position. So this had a top case with just a little nub that came off the top. Now you're probably not going to find a switch with a three inch throw. If you did, you could just put it up here at the front. So you're going to have to put the switch somewhere near the pivot point. I found it easier to release a switch to start the cycle instead of press a switch. So I'm on the back side of the pivot. When I push the pedal, it lets go of the switch and that starts the cycle. So you'll just have to check which one of the three are the normally closed and normally opened and use the appropriate one. To fine tune the switch timing, the top of the, the foot pedal has essentially a big set screw on it. I can adjust this from the top. There's a little split in there. And it's got a little plastic nub. The intention was to keep from doing damage to the switch, but I guess that didn't work. And then once, you know, from the top, I like the timing, I could go in with a small wrench and use this nut as a jam nut to stop the uh, to stop that adjustment from moving. So I think that covers it. So this is the one I'm actually using now. I planned to open this up and see what this looked like inside. I started. To, I expected to find some kind of access panel on the bottom, but it looks like there's just a a long pin that goes through it. And they headed each side to keep it from coming apart. Now, usually I have uh, quite a bit of trouble with leaving well enough alone, but in this case, that would require I think drilling these things out. I don't know. I might just leave well enough alone here. But I think you get the idea. Anyway, I hope that answered some of the questions from the first video. And uh, as always, I hope you found that interesting.